This is Gordon from Solar Eclipse Timer. If you are someone that believes that the Titan Hall itself was the reason for the implosion, then this video is for you. I will lay out the issues as I tell a story about the serious problems with the layers of the co-bonded 5-inch thick hull. Everything had too much porosity, and the glue film layers were woefully inadequate. This is based on evidence from testimony at the Titan Coast Guard hearings. To understand the problems that were found with the co-bonded layers from the wreckage, we need to briefly discuss what is known about inward deflection of the hull. Because if the V2 hull was becoming weaker, inward deflection was going to cause the failure. There is some information about the V1 hull. There is very little known about the V2 hull. Here is the information we have about the weak point in a long cylindrical hull. Listen to Tony Nissen. Brian Spencer's design and analysis report talked about the DAR predicts failure to be hoop failure on the inner surface at the center of the cylinder at about 2.21 times the design pressure. What this means is Spencer thought the most stress and strain was in the middle of the eight foot span of the hull. We have no publicly released data from an engineering company for predictions for the strength of the co-bonded technique used in the V2 hull. The only testing that was done of the V2 hull was five high-pressure dives during four days of testing at the Deep Ocean Test Facility in Maryland. The only publicly available data for those tests are the dive profiles. OceanGate released a document showing how the hull was instrumented during pressure testing to monitor strain. The strain data from the test has not been publicly released. Phil Brooks testified that during testing, they did plot strain against physical movement of the hull to know the relationships, but he did not have the data during his testimony. So they did look into that. And we had done plot to the actual physical distance um, and I don't have those, that calculation with me, but we had gone through that process, you know, to kind of validate what we were seeing. We don't know if they had any engineering predictions to try to match, but they must have felt good about the performance of the hull. I imagine they had data that looked similar to what they would later get from the Titanic dives, something that looked like this. Now we are ready to talk about the two things that could have made the hole weak right from the time of fabrication and perhaps weaker after multiple dives. And the issue is the potential for increased inward deflection because that is what will link to the NTSB wreckage findings. Number one, it starts with the fact that the layup, the curing, and the deep bulking did not achieve the Torre specifications for porosity for the product they were using. The specs for the system, if cured properly, had an expected mean void volume of 0.461%. Let's see what Dr. Kramer said about that. We also observed porosity between composite plies. The higher magnification images reveal the laminate structure of the hull. In between the plies, there were thin layers of resin that contained porosity. Several examples of pores within this fine resin layer are indicated by the red ovals. The amount of porosity within these resin layers was estimated to be between 18 and 27 percent. This number, 18 to 27 percent, was an NTSB lab estimation of the fraction of porosity by an area of measurement on a layer cut obliquely. Touré has published data for the expected porosity when their product is properly cured. And of course, their tensile and compressive strength data would be based on a product with the specified porosity. More specifically, could porosity be the cause of producing an overall thickness that exceeds five inches? I think the best way that I can answer that question is to note that that the material in question does have some data available for it as far as what the expected porosity content is. And the expectation is that the porosity content should be in the vicinity of 0.4 to 0.5%. The NTSB sent a piece of the recovered hull to an outside lab to measure total porosity by volume, and that lab, when measuring three pieces, found porosity as high as 3.6%, followed by 3.3%, and then 1.1%. When we uh, sent samples out for porosity measurement, we came back with 
values that um, on average were about 2.2% for porosity. And this is when the Torre specification should be 0.4 to 0.5% porosity. So using the average percentage, the Ocean Gate carbon fiber layup had a porosity that was 5.7 times greater than the manufacturer's specifications. And another issue was that the layers were not symmetrical over the one inch thickness of the layup. And when we looked at the structure of the composite, we noted that at the base of the layer, there was you know, no visual indication of porosity, but when we looked towards the top of the layer, as we showed in the image, there was an indication of porosity. Um, and so, you know, obviously, um, porosity is um, open volume, and so um, that is certainly something to be considered. It seems that these two issues could contribute to not achieving the desired strength of the Torre product, excessive porosity overall, and uneven porosity due to the application and debulking process. Remember, the goal is to limit the inward deflection of the hole, which is going to be important in the next segment when we talk about the defects in the glue. The problem is that OceanGate did no destructive testing of the co-bonding process. On those two, we, they were not, not multi-cure, they were just single cure. We did not do the, the same technique that we did with the full-size hull, which was, like I said, the, the multi-cure and the... So that, that's basically kind of the synopsis of the third scale testing. Perhaps the NTSB has data that has not been released to the public. So now let's talk about the glue co-bonding process. I think you will be surprised by this. There is presently no public information about the manufacturer of the glue film that was used to co-bond the one-inch layers together. I find this odd since this is such a crucial component. The NTSB factual report has the exact carbon fiber system from Torre listed and the exact epoxy glue for the rings listed, but no information about the glue between between the plies. Do we know how the uncured light green adhesive was applied? So we're talking about the adhesive that is used to join the layers? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, that is provided as a sheet or a film, and, and so it's, that's essentially how it's applied. It comes as a, a big sheet, and then it's just draped over the, um, over the hull. The image on the right shows a cross-section through a trimmed end piece of the hull. The lighter lines spaced about an inch apart are the layers of film adhesive used to join the carbon fiber composite layers. In a minute, I will show the NTSB images that document how terrible the glue bonding was, but let's list the problems. We do not know what glue film product was used. We do not know how the next layer of carbon fiber was tensioned over the glue to create a good bond on top of the glue. We do not know the effect of high temperature curing on the glue layer. Remember that autoclaving was done after each carbon fiber layer. So the initial layer of glue was autoclaved four times, the next layer three times, the next layer two times, and the last layer of glue one time. The Torre specifications for autoclaving and laminate curing were quite intense. The specs were 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 120 to 180 minutes. At this time, we have no information about the effect of autoclaving the glue layer multiple times. The crucial point here is that the glue has to be so strong, it's like it's not there. These five layers have to effectively behave as a single five inch thick hull. The glue has to be a perfect bond. Stockton would boast about the thickness of the hull. So we have a, a carbon fiber hull, five inches thick. There's 667 layers of carbon fiber what would people think if he explained the real design, saying something like this? The hole is made of one inch layers, each with 133 plies of carbon fiber, but five of these layers are glued together with a film adhesive, creating a five inch thick hull. That doesn't sound quite as strong, does it? It turns out, in pieces recovered from the ocean floor, there was a tremendous amount of porosity in the glue layer. It was far from 100% bond. Finally, investigators observed voids in the adhesive used to join the co-bonded layers. 
Some voids were present in all layers. However, at the interface between the first and second layers and between the third and fourth layers, some of the voids formed elongated structures in the adhesive. A thin strip of hull material at the layer one and layer two adhesive joint was snapped open, and the resulting fracture surface is shown in the lower image. The green regions are fractured adhesive. The checkerboard patterns were left behind by the peel ply that was used during the curing process and then subsequently removed. The areas where you see this pattern were associated with the voids. Do you have any idea how much glue was used in this hull? I think you'll be shocked. If we look at it in three dimensions, each layer is a cylinder, and we can easily calculate the surface area using the formula 2 pi r h, where r is the radius and h is the length of the titan. It turns out that the titan was literally held together by 547 square feet of glue. We'll just break down the first layer. The inside diameter of the hole was 59 inches, so adding one inch to each side gives us a diameter of 61 inches, or a radius of 30.5 inches, or 2.54 feet. The length of the hole was 98 inches, or 8.17 feet. When you plug those numbers into the formula, the first layer has a surface area of glue film of 130 square feet. Think of it this way, that is the floor area of an 8 by 16 foot room. The second, third, and fourth layers each get an additional 1 inch layer added, so the radius goes up each time. So the total is 547 square feet. Now look at it from this perspective. A perfect example of a deep submersible with a proven design is the Alvin. Its hull is an 83-inch inside diameter sphere made of 2.9 inches of titanium with precision welded joints. Compare that to the Titan. Its hull is five one-inch thick layers of carbon fiber glued together with 547 square feet of glue. The problem was this, the glue layers were breaking down and OceanGate had no idea about this danger. The small black voids we saw on cross-section were breaking down into patches of powdered glue. When the NTSB found this powder on the surface of the glued layers, they compared the chemical content to the intact glue and the content matched. This proved that this was powdered glue. Voids were observed on the surface of the piece, like those observed on the trimmed end. As shown in the images above, some of these voids contained cream-colored debris that was readily removed with the tip of a fine blade and a synthetic bristle brush. The debris was collected and its chemical spectrum was analyzed along with a sample of the green film adhesive. As seen in this image, the debris and the adhesive had similar spectral peak positions and relative peak intensities. Then Dr. Kramer adds that they found evidence of movement between the first and second layers. They saw inline cracks, spalled adhesive, and rub marks between the layers. There were also physical characteristics consistent with rubbing. As shown in the image and indicated by the red arrows, the adhesive exhibited rubbing marks that were oriented in the longitudinal direction. So in some areas, under compression, the layers in the hole were slightly deflecting independently of each other and rubbing against each other. The predicted deflection of the hole, perhaps made worse by the matrix porosity and the hole grinding spots, seemed to be causing the breakdown of the glue film. The other confusing issue about this hull is that the laminate porosity amount and locations is random and scattered throughout the hull. Porosity issues are combined with the surface grind spots that were created randomly on the hull. So this hull could have patches or regions of weakness. Phil Brooks testified that only 13 of the 16 strain gauges were working, and the strain gauges were fixed to specific areas on the inside surface of the hull, probably in eight groups. So strain gauges don't monitor 100% of the hull, and they monitor the inside surface, not individual layers. So this data was not sensitive enough to make OceanGate aware of the glue issues. Let's finish with a real-life example of something many of you will know about. This is laminated veneer lumber, or LVL. 
These are beams made of slices of wood with the grain in the same direction, and they are glued together. These are incredibly strong beams in compression when used vertically. In this direction, they have very little deflection, so the glue bonds stay strong. But what would happen if you placed them on the flat side and did cycles of loading and unloading them in the center? With bending them back and forth, the motion of the laminated layers compressing on the top and stretching on the bottom would eventually break down the glue layer due to small shear forces. When the glue breaks down, the layers of laminate are no longer acting as one and the system will slowly become weaker. In the Titan hole, this may have been what was happening. In places, not everywhere, and we don't know exactly where, but there were places where the five layers were no longer acting as a unit. In summary, this hole was plagued by porosity in the carbon fiber plies and porosity in the four glue layers. Then factor in the unknown number and depth of the grind spots and the effect of five rounds of high temperature autoclaving. Since no co-bonded scale models were built and tested, and there was not destructive analysis to validate the fabrication process, this was a one-off hull with no way to calculate the final strength of the hull or to understand its potential weaknesses. Thank you for watching. I appreciate your time. Please comment, like, and share it to help the algorithm suggest the video to others. If you enjoyed the content, consider subscribing.